One Night at Flumpty's has been known to be one of the best FNAF fan games ever made, and not just the first one. It's been consistently praised for its mechanics, game design, and visuals. That's saying something, as there's quite a few fan games it has to compete with. Pop Goes, Fred Bear Frights, Five Nights at Candies, and even JR's. This video is going to be talking about why One Night at Flumpty's is so loved, and how its production haunted its creator. While a lot of earlier FNAF fan games feel like a reskin of the original Five Nights at Freddy's game, One Night at Flumpty's changed things quite a bit. Instead of having five nights, it just had one. But this one night is all it needed to jump into everyone's recommended within the YouTube horror gaming scene. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier and welcome to One Night at Flumpty's. Welcome to One Night at Flumpty's. Like Let's talk about the first game to see what about it made it so loved. There are a lot of reasons as to why the creator chose to only do one night instead of the usual five. One was to make it different from the rest of the FNAF fan games that were being pumped out during this time. FNAF was always popular, and people wanted to get their names out there, and the best way to do that was to get their games recognized by copying that formula. The creator also wanted the game to feel like an old school horror game, where it progressively get harder the longer the night went on. It's quite hard to balance a game perfectly without making it overly complicated or unfair to play. But in this case, it was a mix of both difficult but fair. There are a bunch of characters that we had to play against with their own unique game mechanics. Flumpty and Birthday Boy Blam are already trying to get you at the start of the night. Flumpty also takes the role of the phone guy, which I absolutely love. Who says this? Hi, I'm Flumpty. I'm a cactus. I'm an egg. I'm immune to the plot and I can transcend time and space. Also, I'm coming after you. You can figure out the rest. Have fun. And yes, he does mean it when he says he doesn't follow the rules of time and space, as he could teleport anywhere, like from the back room all the way to the door if you wanted to, and especially if you aren't paying attention. So you have to watch Flumpty very carefully to know where he is at all times. Not really having any kind of pathing as it seems to be completely random. Although this could be seen as broken, in practice, it's not that bad as he will always only appear in the left door. If you can't find Flumpty in the camera systems, just click the lights to the left and if he isn't there, then you're safe. Birthday Boy Blam is a lot more simple as he has the same game mechanic no matter what, slowly walking from the back room to the right door. You could kind of think of these two as the Bonnie and Chica of this game. The red man is stuck in Camp 3 for the first 3 hours of the game, but once it reaches 3am, he will start to move. Cameras can't see him, but you'll know where he is as the room will appear pitch black. You could kind of remember this as a movable kitchen from FNAF 1, which is probably what inspired this mechanic in the first place. Some of the characters have some kind of lore that I'll explain afterwards, but right now, we could see the room he was hiding in had lava inside of it, with the newspaper saying someone drank lava and lived. Kinda. And telling us who the red man was before he even shown up. His game pathing is the same as Birthday Boy Blam, but he only goes to the left door instead. When looking into the office, or whatever this place is supposed to be, you'll notice a bunch of things like weird stuffed animals, a toaster, and a giant black smudge on the wall. 4am will reveal a clown, the same clown in a painting on the left. Grunkfist the Clown is his name, and the first time he plays this game you may not understand his mechanic fully. The more you play this game, the more you'll notice he'll get closer and closer to your face. I don't think that many FNAF fan games have a way to balance the way you're using the camera systems except for the battery power. In this game, the only power you have is for the doors and the lights. You can use the cameras whenever you want. Until 4am that is. Whenever you flip up the cameras, Grunkfist will try to get closer to you. Once you use the camera 30 times, he will jump scare you. Meaning that every time you use the camera from now on must be done with some sort of purpose. This was done to stress the players more. How long you're actually staring at the cameras doesn't matter, just when you lift it up. In Cam 5, you can see a bunch of eyes in a hole. Exactly 30, which shows how many times you can flip up the camera before a grunk fist will attack you. This is never told to the player directly, and I doubt anyone could figure this out without searching it up on the wiki which is how I even found it. But it's a pretty neat trick after you realize it. The beaver is basically this game's version of Foxy, as you will be sitting on a toilet on Camp 6, but when he disappears, he will run straight to your room. It's very subtle, but his little feet, paws, whatever beavers have.
Huh. Their feet are just called web feet and their hands are called paws. Okay. So his web feet get replaced with knives when he runs up to you. It's really subtle since it moves really fast and the animation is super quick. If you do even notice this animation, you're probably already dead. Also, Golden Flumpty doesn't exist. If you believe he does, you're crazy. Go see Kelp, please. That's the game mechanic of every single creature within Flumpty's. In the newspaper, we see a bunch of things written. One of them being that Flumpty kidnapped the person just because he felt like it. Which is implied to probably mean us. Like Flumpty said before, he defies time and space so every game seems to be an area created by Flumpty since he uses us just for entertainment. You might be wondering why Flumpty doesn't just teleport straight into our room to kill us. That would be too easy for him. Like I said, this is just a game for him and you are just another piece of entertainment. That seems to be the whole story of the game. As you could probably tell by the character design of this game, it's not meant to be taken seriously. I mean, birthday boy Blam wears fancy clothing in the hallway near the office, and the main enemy of this game is supposed to be a giant egg. Like most games, there are unused or cut content. There was supposed to be a Ronald McDonald painting instead of the regular clown painting used, which would slowly crawl out as the night progressed. But that idea would be scrapped and replaced with Grumpfist the Clown in the wall. Jonochrome, who is the creator of One Eye of Flumpties, also stated that he thought Grunkfist was totally a better clown in his words. But the reality of it was probably due to copyright reasons. In Camp 6, there was supposed to be a male human character, but got replaced with the beaver. I genuinely like the design of the beaver, so this is probably for the best. Originally, all the characters within this game were supposed to be different versions of Flumpty, but he thought the idea of an egg used multiple times was too repetitive. Now, for the removal of one thing that changed the game from being S tier to only respectable A tier. The removal of the honking sound when you click on a clown's nose. There was no reason to take this out and it would have elevated the game to the next level, but that's just my opinion. After beating the game, you reach Ham. <laughs> Not 6am, Ham, in which a cartoonish end screen showing all the characters in a childish way would show up, ending the game. What's kind of sad to realize is this game was just a joke to the creator. He did not expect this game to blow up as much as it did. I love this game, and many of you probably love it as well. But to him, he didn't feel as though it was worth the praise. Even comparing it to be too close to the original Finance of Freddy's game that it was based on. People wanted a sequel, and he wanted to give it to them. But how? He never thought about it, and this stressed him out. Now that there's a lot of people who actually want to play the sequel, he didn't want just to disappoint them. The first game was created stress-free since like I mentioned before, it was just a joke. The second one took a lot more effort and had a lot more stressful nights. In his YouTube channel, he described his experience of creating the game. In it, he talks about a nightmare he had at a relative's house where he'd be in a garage with a light switch. In front of him was a hallway that monsters would walk past. If the room was dark, they wouldn't be able to see him. The one time he kept the lights on, the monsters charged at him which caused him to wake up. Using the influence of that nightmare, he based his second game off of it. With these nightmares and the way he talks about not feeling proud of his first game, it was obvious he was terrified of something. Not living up to people's expectations. It's easy to look at the final product of something without realizing the amount of work or effort that got put into it. And the idea that people are going to be judging your work can be horrifying to some people, especially with how some people act. Garten of Ban Ban is in my opinion a bad game. You know what I'm gonna do when I think something's bad? Just say that it's bad online and I'm probably gonna make a video on that game. However, there are some people who are literally going out of their way to send death threats and doxing the creator of that game because they think it's a horrible game. Is that an extreme example? Definitely. But it's what a lot of these game developers think will happen to them if their game doesn't perform to the viewer's expectations. This dream was about the Super Mario Sunshine game where there was a small bar in a corner that filled up which he put in the actual game as the exposure meter. More on that later. The most nerve wracking issue for him was the balancing of the game itself so with the inclusion of the exposure meter, everything he was so worried about seemed to disappear. Playing the game for himself, he felt proud, as well as feeling surprised for how smoothly the gameplay felt with all of its new mechanics. 
Just a few bug fixes here, touching up some elements there, polishing some of the designs, and the game was ready to be released. There are some things he hated about FNAF 2, like the game feeling too difficult, since one mistake meant a game over screen, with how the camera systems also felt completely useless except for using the music box. Most of the time, you just had to use your flashlight and mask to make all the animatronics stay away from the office, only using a camera to rerun the box. With nearly every single character from FNAF 2 feeling the same, he decided to do something major. Every character in his game needed to feel unique in some way. Most people expected him to do the same thing as the first game, create a Finance of Freddy's 2 game with some subtle changes, but he defied expectations. Let's talk about the game mechanics that are shown within the game. You're probably wondering how this exposure meter that I talked about before works. Whenever someone shows up in the hallway, you have about half a second to shut off the lights. Even if you miss that timer, you won't get jump scared. Instead, the exposure meter moves up. Once the meter is completely filled though, you will get jump scared by anything that shows up, and also have to restart the entire night all over again. It's a really unique but fair way to balance a game. Like in the first game, Flumpty doesn't really have a set pathing mechanic, instead, he will teleport all over the place. Birthday Boy Blim is the same as the first game, slowly walking towards the player's room and standing in the hallway for a bit, raising the exposure meter as well. The Owl is a new character who's sleeping on a urinal. After waking up, he will start to go through either the left or right vent which the player needs to seal in order not to get attacked. Failing to do so will lead to a jump scare, but if you close the right one, you'll hear a thud sound. The creator got recommended from multiple people to make a foxy character to be able to go through the left or right side of the halls. He didn't know how to implement it with the beaver character though, and everyone who recommended this thought he was going to be using a beaver again for this, but that got replaced by the owl. This was a unique take on the original Foxy character, and many people loved the concept. Also, the beaver died. Rest in feces. Grunkfist the Clown comes back, but this time you can see him in the cameras. At 2am, he will start to become active, having a patience meter. You will know he is active since he creates this hole in the wall as well. This patience meter will go down, and the only way to see it is going to the room that he is located in. Once this meter hits zero, it will cause him to go through the hole in the wall, quickly raising your exposure meter. The red man from the first game is now a virus for some reason? Every so often, a virus will appear on the camera systems. If you don't hit cancel, 10 seconds after it finishes downloading will lead to a jump scare and needing to restart the level. Eyesore was in the first game but we never saw its body. At 4am, he will emerge from the pit that he's staying in and travel to the office. He fills the exposure meter extremely fast, almost instantly, so you have to pay extra attention to him. Probably because he has the most amount of eyes to look at us. Golden Flumpty doesn't exist, he's not real if you think he's really crazy, Golden Flumpty is in your imagination. Now, with 7 characters to watch out for, you would think that this game would be unfairly hard, but that's not the case. The only automatic deaths are from the Owl and the Red Man. Everyone else just raises your exposure meter. If the exposure meter didn't exist, then every time someone entered the hallway with the lights on, that would just be an automatic jump scare. This game would be almost impossible without it. The reason the exposure meter was so important was due to the balancing nightmare that the creator had before. Like I said before, the creator hated the fact that the only function the camera had was to wind up the music box, but it felt basically useless at that point, which is why he decided to make it more important here. Needing it to track where every character was so you could avoid your exposure meter from rising, as well as making sure the owl, red man, and clown are not after you. The cameras did feel important here, so he did his job. There was also a charging station. Every time you had your camera open, you couldn't just keep it open forever, as you would need to charge it whenever you need to put it down for a few seconds, then put it back up. Whenever you don't use a camera, it automatically charges so this was a cool feature to limit abusing the camera systems. For the cut content, there was this blind character with stitch eyes and big ears that was supposed to be using the gimmick of not making any sound. What this probably meant was that you probably couldn't move at all when he appeared, but this seemed difficult to put in the game properly so he just left it out. Grunkfist the Clown was supposed to be similar to the puppet from the FNAF 2 game, but the idea got scrapped completely because he hated the idea of the music box mechanic as a whole. Believing it just to be a bad design and overused in many other FNAF fan games, the biggest thing he added was adding a second, much harder night, hard-boiled mode. 
He didn't want to add a second night to the first game since he felt like he was just using old ideas so there was no real point. But for the second game, these were mostly new concepts and wanted to challenge the players with ideas he created himself. This was a game that didn't feel like a FNAF clone but its own independent game itself. What's admirable is the fact that he playtested the game for himself as well, especially hard boiled mode to see if it was possible. He wouldn't have released it if he couldn't beat it since it would mean that it was most likely too unfair for the average player. Like I said, the one night at Flumpty's game was more or less like a FNAF clone that got well received. The second game was his own kind of independent thing that got inspired by the original FNAF games instead. Slowly, there was progress with the series showing the dedication for game development, at least at that point. Mental health of game developers can be quite concerning as motivation to finish something may not always be there. Remember, these games are free and from what I could tell, he didn't have a Patreon or anything similar to connect any kind of donations. Around the release of FNAF 4, hype for the game rose, so he decided to make one week at Flumpty's. This was going to be a bigger game as the previous two only had one official night, not including hard boil mode. This is when he had a decline of motivation to even finish the game, as well as having other issues. He made the entire map and designed it so you could close off rooms to prevent the characters from getting into your office. However, this was incredibly flawed. The player could easily trap the characters and beat the rest of the night without doing much else, so it was ridiculously easy. He has been shown to be amazing at game design from the previous two games he created, but honestly, he didn't want to finish this game at all. He started it but it was more of a spur in a moment rush to want to create something. In the end, he cancelled his game in order to spare himself from creating a game that would have just disappointed or annoyed him. He felt as though he wouldn't have been able to create something that was going to be enjoyed by others. And even if he did, he himself wouldn't have enjoyed making it, so what was the point? Which is why he cancelled the project altogether. Fan bases can make a game live on for much longer than what's normal. Falling in love with the design of certain characters, people can make fan art, their own stories using his characters. Some people were so obsessed with the character designs that they wanted more just so they could see their favorite characters again. Although he built this cult-like small audience that loved his artwork, characters, and games, he started to hate it all. The repetitive designs that would show up in every single game, these characters started off as a joke character in a game that was not meant to be taken seriously, but now, people kept asking for more. I want more games, I want more of my favorite characters, I want this, I want that, can you just please release your next game already? It appeared he did at least try to get invested with One Week at Flumpty's development as he tried to include lore within a game, but that killed his motivation even more after he thought about it. Yes, he could have made lore about this game, adding little mini games after each night like in FNAF 2 or 4, but why? This joke of a game was starting to become too real for him, something he didn't want to happen. It was supposed to be this funny little egg that was supposed to be kind of scary to the player. This isn't the only case like this, a creator making something they aren't that passionate in which blows up, forcing them to either lose that quick popularity or force themselves to work more on that project that they slowly hate, causing them to hate everything about it. Eventually everything went silent from Jonochrome, two games that were well loved but would haunt the creator. This would be the death of Flumpties forever. At least, that's what people thought. Nearly four years later, Jonochrome would receive an email. This wouldn't have been that big of a deal as he made a filter for any emails that uses the word Flumpty or FNAF to be sent straight to his trash. This was due to people constantly sending him emails about why he cancelled One Week at Flumpty's, if he's still making new games, and just spamming him about things he didn't want to get involved with anymore. However, one email stood out. Looking in a trash bin, he got an email from Scott Coffin, the original creator of FNAF himself. This was an invitation to the Fazbear Fanverse initiative. If you don't know what that is, it's a collection of a bunch of different creators of FNAF fan games, specifically the extremely popular ones. Quote, A giant collaboration involving several fan game creators who have made some of the most popular fan games over the years here in the community. It's a project that's designed to invest into those franchises, give back to the developers, and hopefully bring new entries to the franchises as well. 
Many famous developers are invited with Jonochrome. Finites of Candies, Joy of Creation, and Popgoes were some of them. This deal was already pretty amazing, but the thing was, Scott didn't require him to make a third game, just to support what he already made. This was a pretty good deal for him, though this also made him motivated to make another game, getting shouted out by the original FNAF creator. Instead of making a game that was going to please the audience waiting for him, this was going to be a game he wanted to make. This game was extremely different, taking place in some frozen area, having a temperature meter. Just by being in the room, your temperature will slowly go down, which requires you to walk towards a furnace to your left to warm up every so often. There was also a camera system that was taken from the second game as well. Whenever a character would show up, you would need to take a picture of them to make them go away. Now, for the character mechanics. Birthday Boy Blam never seems to change, even from the first game. He always walks towards your room, but in this game, if he's in a hallway, you need to take a picture of him to make him run away. I like this concept, as in a horror game, you're literally staring at a dark hallway, with the flashing camera being your only source of light. Grunkfist the Clown is someone you don't want to flash your camera light against, since he will jump scare you, which is shown in his camera sign that he's covering up. Though, once he leaves the area, it's obvious on what not to do. Just wait for him to leave and he should be fine. The Red Man starts on Camp 4 and will enter the office through the furnace. If you see him going through the fire portal or missing, don't go near the furnace or else he will jump scare you. Some people commented saying the furnace feels like the music box they stand near instead. But the reason why he included this mechanic was to create somewhere where you felt safe, as here you get warmed up and in the beginning, don't really have to worry about anything. Only after the red man shows up, you'll realize that no matter where you go, it's not safe, which only adds to the fear factor. The beave owl is a hybrid between the owl and the beaver which I love the concept of. This is supposed to be the actual final game of the series and you want to bring back these characters. Trying to think of a way to include both of them in the game was difficult since they had the same exact mechanic. After exploring many different ways to try and find a way to create unique mechanics for each of them, like maybe each of them go to a different room or go to a different side of the place, he failed to do so, which is why he thought of a way to just create a hybrid instead, which I love. On camera 3, he'll be relaxing inside the hot tub and slowly seen entering the vent. Once he's no longer shown in a vent, take a picture of him so he can run away. Eyesore is the same as Birthday Boy Blam, but he needs two flashes to get rid of him, and cannot be seen on a camera so it's hard to notice. Though, when he's in the halls, you'll definitely know, as his eyes are extremely noticeable. Also, this is one of the most terrifying jump scares I think I've ever seen in any kind of FNAF game. Gordon Flumpty isn't real, he isn't real, stop bringing him up. He's not real. Usually, I start off by talking about Flumpty, so you may have noticed I've decided not to bring him up. Well, when you beat the game, this happens. Flumpty restarts the level and kills off every single character. If you remember all the way back from the first game, one out of Flumpty's was supposed to use only different versions of Flumpty himself, which is brought to life in this game. When you first played this game, you probably would have noticed that Flumpty was missing the entire time. He's the main character and he's always shown. The series is even named after him, but here? He wasn't anywhere to be seen. At least, not until you beat the first phase of this game. Every single character he would murder would get replaced with a version of Flumpty. This game starts to mess with you at this point, creating new features on the fly, creating new rooms to appear, numbers begin appearing out of nowhere, the door's power usage is out of control, and even the colors of the game change. Flumpty changed the rule of the game to make it more fun for himself. Finally, this is a hard night, but if you manage to beat it and actually hit 6am for the second time, you'll finally reach the ending, which reveals this cutscene.
You escaped. You beat him. But we find out that the world outside is in ruins. We're not sure if this is because of Flumpty or something else happened, but it appears that we escaped only to find ourselves in an even more dangerous landscape. This game felt like what FNAF was missing, taking elements from those games but taking out the parts that felt unnecessary or just repetitive to make a game that felt fresh and exciting. It knew never to take itself seriously but at the same time wanted to do something that felt new. That's why I love this series so much. It was amazing but also kind of sad to realize how much the creators struggled to make the games. Pressure from people as well as internal issues. Something I stated in other videos, FNAF 3 is where the series should have ended as it wrapped off things as well as it could, killing off the main villain as well as making the children's souls pass away peacefully. Although there wasn't much of a story for the Flumpty series, it's kind of fitting for all the characters to be killed off by Flumpty himself, who only viewed everyone else as toys. The creator of the series viewed these games as nothing more as jokes in the beginning. The same way that Flumpty was done playing with his toys is the same way the creator is done creating these games. What's amazing is that this series isn't actually dead, at least not by its fans. There's a fan version of One Night of Flumpty's 4 that's being created, just not by Jonochrome. Like how FNAF has its own fan games, One Night of Flumpty's is now getting its own kind of fan games, which is honestly pretty wholesome to think about. One person got inspired to create a game which inspired even more people. One day, maybe I'll try out that new fan game to make a review on it as well. But in the meantime, I've been talking for a long time, so I'm gonna go take a nap. If you like this video, like and subscribe, and hopefully, I'll see you next time. Peace.